Greetings. I'm the Electrofogy. Grounding. What the heck is it? Everybody says it's really important. And if you're a musician, you know it is. Because if your equipment is not grounded properly, it sounds terrible. But why? Everyone you ask tells you something different. And all the explanations sound like voodoo. Well, let's see if we can sort this out. Before I continue this talk, I should say that I got my information from this video from a lot of different sources, mainly real life, but I have to give a big shout out of appreciation to Bill Beatty. A lot of his uh, information on his website, The Amateur Scientist, is very helpful. If you want to, go ahead and look at some of his articles. The link is in the description below. Now the first thing we have to talk about grounding is the Earth. The Earth is kind of a funny place. Besides being, like, really big and conducive to life and everything, we all stick to it. Gravity, what can you do? Another funny thing about Earth is, it's conductive. In other words, uh, electricity will run through it. Now, there is some resistance, just like in our bodies, there's resistance to current, but just like in our bodies, electricity will flow through it. Now, interestingly enough, all around Earth at any given time, there are voltages that are being developed, usually static charges, but sometimes piezoelectric charges. But all the time, there are these voltages going on in the environment all around us. Now, the thing about these voltages is, though, they usually will dissipate fairly rapidly because the Earth is conductive. I mean, imagine that you're standing by a lake and you have a bucket full of water and you dump that water into the lake. Now, the lake will slightly rise in level all over as the water dissipates all through the lake. And it's basically always going to be level. And this is the way it is with electric charge and the Earth. As long as the Earth is conductive, it's going to allow charges to dissipate. You can see this charge dissipation in action here at my sink. The sink and faucet are metal, and they're connected to my town's metal water pipes buried underground under the street. So every part of this sink is touching the Earth. I've cut a plastic bag into strips here, and now I will charge them up. Now, as you can see, they're charged with static electricity and stick to my body. At this point, I'll rub my hand with the strips of plastic on the faucet. It's kind of stubborn there. Now, the static charge has dissipated into the earth, and the plastic bag no longer sticks to me. Now, you might ask yourself, if the earth is conductive, can we send power through it? Like, can we send a signal through it? Well, you have to remember that in order to be useful to us, electricity has to be in a circuit so that the electricity goes from the power source to whatever's using it and then back to the other terminal of the power source. So we can't just apply electricity to the ground and then power up something far away. We're going to have to have at least one wire carry power to that thing and then the power can return through the actual earth. And in fact, older telegraph systems used to use this to save money. So they only had to run one wire from one telegraph station to the next, and then the earth would allow the return path to the initial sender. Now this worked okay in, say, the northeastern area of the United States, but when they tried it in the southwest deserts of the United States, it didn't work so well. 
because the ground there is very dry and it's not conductive. Even up in the northeast it wasn't all that reliable. And so, in order to make the systems work, they had to use two wires to send their signals along. And that's the way we have everything today. Now back when electricity was first being introduced into people's houses, besides trying to decide whether direct current or alternating current should be used, they also would make sure that everything was very well insulated so that the electricity wouldn't, you know, get out and shock people who would touch wires and stuff like that. And this would make sense. I mean, you want things insulated and you want them protected and you want them isolated from anything that's going to take the voltage away. Now, there's a problem with this. Remember that on Earth, static voltages develop through various means, usually dust blowing along in the wind. And imagine that you have a long wire going to some old guy's farmhouse. He's just installed electricity and they've had some dust blowing. And there might be some voltage on those lines with reference to ground. But because the overhead transmission wires are insulated, there's no way for this charge to dissipate. So there could be some voltage along there outside of what's coming from the power plant. And how much voltage would that be? Well, nobody knows. It's impossible to predict. It could be very large, hundreds, thousands of volts on a good stormy day. So just imagine that you're some old guy. You just woke up from a rainstorm and you go to make yourself some toast. Now back then, toasters used and other appliances used the external case of the appliance as a negative, you know, as one of the conductors. It wasn't necessarily negative because positive and negative have no meaning in true alternating current. It's like one is positive and the other is negative, then one goes positive and the other goes negative and they change polarity. But anyways, to save money, these appliances would have the outer skin as one of the two conductors. And it's normally not a problem, but imagine that you go and make your toast, and as you go to put the bread in, there could be thousands of volts of static electricity in those wires and energizing this case. And if you're standing with one hand on the stove, say, you could get a huge arc going from the toaster through your body. I mean, just imagine some old farmer making himself some toast and he gets a huge zap. He's like, all right, geez, I just put this brand new fangled electricity in my house and my darn toaster cost me almost 25 cents. First time I go to use it, I almost die. Whatever you do, don't you get electricity in your house. That's the biggest mistake I ever made. So insulating the system from the ground is causing us some problems. Now, how do we solve that problem? Now, you have to remember that the transmission wires are always of opposite polarities to one another, and the voltages carried are only referenced to one or the other. So as one of the wires goes positive, the other wire goes negative, and then the first wire goes negative, and then the second wire goes positive at the same time. And they both kind of seesaw back and forth. They call this balanced power in audio. But, as I said, it can cause problems. So, what they did to solve that is they took one of those conductors and attached it to the ground. And they attach it at several points to the ground. And they always have to remember to attach the same wire. Because if at one house one of the conductors is grounded and at another house the other one is grounded, well, that'll be a short circuit through the ground. Now, the voltage in the two wires is still of opposite polarities at all times, but one of those wires is now referenced to ground all the time because it's connected to ground. So, in one wire, that voltage is always going to be zero. And because the other wire is referenced to the first wire for at the power company, the voltage is always going to be either positive or negative with respect to ground, but the wire that's connected to ground is always going to be zero. So now everything is tied in to the earth. Now you might think 
that attaching one of the wires to ground means that some of the power is going to short out into the ground and dissipate. But that's not the case. There are always two wires, one going from the power company and one coming to the power company, and the power company always makes sure that there's a voltage difference between the two wires. So there's always going to be power going from one wire to your appliances and back to the power company. This circuit means that the power always flows through the two wires, and because the two wires have less resistance than the ground, the power's not going to go out that way. With this system, the wire that's attached to the ground we call the neutral wire, because the wire is always zero volts because it's always grounded. If you were to walk up and touch the neutral wire, nothing would happen because it's grounded and so are you. Now the other wire is because it's referenced to ground means that it always has some voltage, either plus 60 or minus 60, depending on where you live. And if you touch that wire, you will get a shock because you are referenced to ground and it is only referenced to the neutral wire. So by attaching the neutral wire to ground, we get rid of the problem of large static charges in the system, even if the system is insulated at most points along the way. If a static charge tries to develop on the neutral wire, well, it's going to dissipate into ground just like any other static charge. If a static charge developed on the hot wire, the power company is the location that makes sure that the reference between the two voltages is always 60 volts plus or minus. If it's outside of that, the power company has the equipment to dissipate that charge. So, big static charges along the power system are not a problem as long as you have neutral wire well attached to ground. So, now that we've attached one of those two wires that goes into our house to a good earth ground, it's now touching ground, and it's referenced to zero volts. So whatever signal is coming in on the other wire is automatically referenced properly to ground, to zero. So instead of one wire being plus 60 volts and the other being minus 60 volts, now one wire is always zero, and the other wire goes from positive 60 to negative 60 to positive 60 to negative 60 and so on and so forth and things are a lot more predictable and that makes it safer because now these wires can't develop a huge external voltage on them. Now there's just one problem with this scheme when it was first adopted all the electrical outlets looked like this Now, as you can see, there's no difference between one side of the plug and the other. And you could plug something in upside down. Now, usually that wasn't a problem. I mean, honestly, if you uh, just have a light bulb or something, if you plug the light bulb in correctly, the tip of the light bulb is energized and the outer sheath is neutral. It's grounded. Now, if you plug it in the wrong way, all that happens is, the tip is grounded and at zero volts, and the external sheath is energized. And that's normally not a problem until you go to touch the light bulb. And it's possible because you're touching the ground that you could get a shock. And uh, this is the way it was back when electricity was first installed in people's houses. Back then, people would have something like this toaster and it was set up so that the external skin of the toaster was actually the neutral conductor. They saved wiring costs that way. The thing is, if you plugged it in the wrong way, the external part of this toaster could become energized. And that happened to me one time. I was living in an old house in Chicago with two roommates while I was getting my electrical engineering degree. And one day, I was standing at the stove cooking something and I needed a bottle of spice or something. So I put my hand on the stove and I reached for the spices and I rubbed my arm by accident on the toaster. And I got zapped by the toaster. Now of course the reason for that is we'd plug it in wrong and it was an old appliance. 
These days, appliances like this do not use their external skin as the neutral conductor. It's, that's illegal, at least in the U.S. and probably most places in the world. But we had ourselves an old toaster from grandmother, and uh, I got hurt. Now, you know, it wasn't a lasting hurt or anything. But the thing is, two of the three of us living in that house were electrical engineering students. We should have known, but we didn't. And that's how my grandmother taught me electrical engineering. The solution to this problem was to make the outlet and the plugs asymmetrical so that they could only fit in one way. And they did this by making the neutral wire plug larger than the hot wire. So you could always tell which one was which and you couldn't plug the plug in backwards. Now you should have a better understanding of why a good earth ground is important. Not because current has to flow into the ground, but because now whatever you're using is properly referenced to ground and to the common voltage reference of zero volts. Now, there's another very important concept that kind of goes along with grounding, and that is shielding. Early scientists like Benjamin Franklin noticed that if you had some sort of metal container and you put something inside that container that was electrically sensitive and outside that metal container you had some fiendish device which was generating electric fields, well, the thing inside the container would not be affected by those voltages. And uh, there was a lot of puzzlement about that, but eventually Michael Faraday discovered kind of what was making the thing work. And that's why they call it these days the Faraday cage, because he was able to dope out what was going on. What's happening is, as you introduce the voltage field to this metal canister, this canister has to be conductive. And because it's conductive, the electrons that are on all of its atoms can move around. So let's say that this happens to be a positive voltage. And it's very high and it's sitting right next to the metal container. Well, this positive voltage will attract electrons to it. Now when that happens, that means there's going to be a surplus of electrons on this side of the pan and a shortage of electrons on this side. That means that this side of the pan becomes negatively charged and this side of the pan becomes positively charged. And what happens is the balance of these charges, the positive charge here, the negative charge here, and the positive charge here, all cancel each other out. So anything inside the shield doesn't feel any electricity. As soon as you take away this fiendish device, all the electrons settle back down and everything is neutrally charged around the shield. So that's how a shield will protect your electronic circuitry. So that's why your iPhone, your laptop, they're all either made out of metal casing or they've got metal casing underneath. But your circuitry is not actually exposed to anything. Now that's interesting and everything, but there can be a problem. For instance, let's say I have some bit of circuitry and I put the circuitry inside of a Faraday cage. Now that bit of circuitry is shielded. It cannot be affected by anything outside of this Faraday cage. But there is a problem with this circuit. Like most circuits, this one has a lead attached to it and it's going to be plugged into something else. Now when I put the circuit inside here, sure the circuit is protected, but the thing is, whatever this is, is going to be plugged into something else, and that something else is probably touching the ground. Gravity. What can you do? So now we have to worry about one other thing. 
what is the voltage between the Faraday cage and Earth ground? We have no way of knowing. It could be anything. Hundreds, thousands of volts. And now, all of a sudden, when we introduce this uh, plug and plug it in to something else that is grounded, now the voltage between the Faraday cage and the circuit inside becomes an issue. This could actually start broadcasting electronic noise into our circuit, and our formerly functioning circuit now won't function anymore. So what's the solution? Well, we have to attach a lead to the Faraday cage and make sure that this lead is attached to a good earth ground. So now, not only is the Faraday cage going to protect the circuit, it's also going to protect it from uh, bad grounding. So, once again, the Faraday cage acts as a protector, but it will work best if it is also grounded. One thing to note about Faraday cages is they still work even if they have holes in them. That's why it's called a Faraday cage and not a Faraday pan. The thing about the holes in a Faraday cage is any electrical signal with a wavelength larger than the diameter of the holes can't get through that Faraday cage. That's why when you have a microwave oven, there's a bunch of small holes drilled into the door cage. The microwaves can't get out because they're larger than the diameter of those holes. But visible light can get in and out, so you can see your food, but you're not cooked as well. Another reason why it's important to ground the outer case of something is because if the electrical stuff inside the casing fails and it starts to short out and everything, there is an outer layer that's grounded so all the electricity will go through the case and to ground instead of through you while you're holding the case. So, this is why they decided it was so important to have good grounding on the outer case of something that they actually added a third wire to the electrical socket. This is a good earth ground. Now I know that neutral is also connected to the ground at various points, but it's not always a perfect connection. And like I say, it's very important for safety reasons to make sure that the outer skin is properly grounded, so they added that third plug. So, Dedicated third wire ground, a very good thing, as long as everything's wired right. The thing about it is, remember, this third wire ground is usually attached to whatever Faraday cage you have. Now, sometimes in a house that has old wiring or faulty wiring or something, this may not be connected to a good earth ground. And the other problem is, the neutral wire might not be connected to a good earth ground either, or both might not be connected. And the thing is, just by looking at the wire, you can't really tell. Now, when I was working for a computer company, they would have us take our digital voltmeters and measure between neutral and ground at an outlet. And what we were looking for was any kind of voltage difference between the two. Now, theoretically, there shouldn't be one. They should all just be at zero volts. But things happen. One thing that uh, can cause that to be different is fluorescent lighting in an office environment. Now, those little curly fluorescent bulbs that we now use to replace incandescents don't act that way but the long fluorescent tubes that you see in schools and offices with cubicle farms and stuff, those all can put a voltage on the neutral wire. And uh, you can measure that by measuring between neutral and ground. Now, our standard back then was we wanted to see less than six tenths of one volt alternating current between neutral and ground. That would indicate that that was an acceptable outlet. So, every once in a while we'd find someone with more than that. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. 0.6 volts. Now, 
we were using digital multimeters. So that means it was measuring alternating current using the root mean squared, RMS method. Now that translates into about 0.7.5 volts peak voltage or about 1.5 volts peak to peak. And that means that there could be 1.5 volts or more peak to peak between neutral and ground. Now, what that means is you could have this difference and it could be, you know, your, your uh, Faraday cage is attached to the earth ground. Your chassis is attached to earth ground. So, that means that the signal going into the actual device might have a little extra voltage riding on it. Now here's the thing. One and a half volts is very close to what we call the digital threshold voltage. Now in digital circuits usually zero volts means a zero and five volts means a one. But what happens if you put a voltage between zero and five volts into a digital circuit? Well, at about one and a half volts, that's where the digital circuit suddenly has trouble determining whether you mean a zero or a one. So if you have one and a half volts or more peak to peak going in here and being injected into your digital circuit, all of a sudden ones become zeros, zeros become ones, and your system's going to have problems. I remember one customer I had, he, we'd go there every once in a while and we'd replace parts, we'd replace terminals, and we, they kept on having trouble. And one day I went there for the first time and I measured between neutral and ground and I found like two, three volts between neutral and ground. And I went up to the customer and I showed him my meter and I said, sir, this is the worst power I have ever seen. You have to get an electrician in here to take a look at your electrical wiring. And so they did, and they got a good electrician. He came in there, made one connection between the junction box and a good earth ground. They never had any trouble again. We had to call them to schedule maintenance appointments because they never had trouble with their computers anymore. That's what can happen if you have improperly grounded stuff, and especially if either one or both the neutral and ground terminal are not properly grounded. Now the problem is trying to explain this to an electrician or to a customer because um, they plug it into the wall, it turns on, and you have to tell the customer, hey listen, you know, that's going to work for a toaster. But if we're talking about a high-speed digital signal having to be propagated along inside this device, we better make sure there's some pretty darn good grounding involved. And uh, one time, I was working with an electrician who was not so good. I was installing a terminal. He was installing the outlet that it was supposed to be plugged into. It was supposed to happen the day before, but, you know, he never got to it for some reason. And I'm watching him wire up this thing. And the thing that caught my eye immediately was he had a three-prong outlet. And he very carefully put the proper color terminals on hot and neutral. And then he took the ground wire and he grounded it, made sure it was screwed in properly to the uh, case of the outlet because it wasn't a third wire for ground. They were just going to use the conduit. And then I noticed he's using plastic conduit. Well, obviously, that's not going to be a good ground. And I said to the guy, hey, that's not, uh, you know, you're with plastic conduit, you're not going to have a good ground circuit. He looks me right in the eye and goes, well, it's mechanically grounded. Mechanically grounded? Are you kidding me? There's no such thing as mechanical ground. I need a good circuit metal going from ground to the actual planet Earth. So plastic conduit just isn't going to work. If you have plastic conduit for whatever reason, you have to have a third wire ground so that you have good grounding on your chassis. Now I'd like to say a few words to any musicians watching this video. There are two things that you need to do to ensure that your equipment sounds good. The first is make sure that the equipment is plugged in to an outlet that has a good earth ground. 
And if you're playing a gig somewhere in a rather old building that has wiring that's very old, it may be very difficult to find an outlet that has good grounding. I saw a YouTube video once put out by a guy and he said that sometimes his band has to find the one good outlet in the place and plug every single bit of equipment into that outlet. And they use all kinds of power strips and extension cords and whatnot, but that's what they have to do to ensure that they have good grounding. Now let's talk about the shielding inside your instrument. Your electrical instrument, even a microphone, is dealing with signals that are microvolts in strength. So that makes these things very sensitive to outside voltages. So it's very important, first of all, to shield every electronic bit inside of your instrument and make sure that the shield is very well grounded along all points. So, as you can see, this red lines around the electronic components represents the shielding. Those all have to be enclosed in a Faraday cage. There's also additional ground lines going to the pickups because the pickups will usually have some shielding around them. Now part of them has to be exposed so the strings can interact, but shield as much of those things as you can. Make sure they're connected to the shielding around all the electronics. In addition, the wires that are going between the pickups and the controls should be coaxial with the outer shield attached to the shield ground around the electronics and the pickups. Finally, between the electronic controls and the external jack where you plug the amp into, that should also be a coaxial cable with a good ground on the shield of that wire. Also, consider the strings. I mean, that's made out of steel, all of that. And they have to be steel so that they interact with the magnetic fields of the pickups. So you've got this big chunk of metal right near there, and that can act as an antenna. And it's even worse when you go to touch the strings to finger a cord, because that adds the conductive mass of your body to the conductive mass of the strings, and now you both form a huge antenna. So that voltage could float. Several hundred volts could be on those strings. So, the way we solve this problem is to ground the bridge, and that bridge had better be made out of metal. Once we've attached the bridge to the ground of the rest of the shielding, and the ground goes through the external jack to the amplifier to a good earth ground, well, now the reference voltage of the strings is going to be zero. Any charge that develops on the strings is immediately siphoned into ground, and it doesn't affect the pickups. So, good grounding and good shielding are essential for an, a musical instrument. Would you like to see me demonstrate how to properly ground the inside of an electric guitar? Well, I'm not gonna, because somebody else has already done that for me. His name is Dave Riom, the owner and proprietor of the video channel Dave's World of Fun Stuff. Here are a couple of links you can click on to see some of his videos where he properly grounds and repairs the electronics of electric guitars. Now let's talk about grounding and shielding in terms of computers. Now, just like musicians, to plug your computer into you should have a good earth ground on your outlet, at least as far as tower PCs are concerned. Some laptops don't need a ground like that because the uh, little power brick that plugs into the wall completely isolates the laptop from any uh, alternating current and it also just sends power to the laptop's battery and all the rest of the laptop runs off the battery. If the laptop has a good Faraday cage inside it and the uh, power going into it is filtered DC, you don't really need to worry about an earth ground connection. And you know, you can run your laptop without it being plugged into anything. And it's shielded and it works just fine. So, but still, you should have a good earth ground on your outlets. Now if you have a tower PC, especially if you're building one yourself, you should ensure that all of it is grounded inside and all the panels are connected and have good continuity 
to the power supply because the power supply can, uh, outside is grounded. So you should take a meter and put it on all of the little panels and make sure you've got continuity between the panel and the power supply. You can even put that continuity meter on the ground terminal of the, the uh, 120 volt uh, power cord and it should have good continuity through there. Consider scraping away the paint between panels. Consider scraping away the paint around screws so that when you screw a panel together that screw then becomes part of the circuit. Now let me talk about people who modify their computers, computer modders. I have no problem at all with that. I, computer mods are works of art. They express your personality. I have complete respect for those. Now the thing about it is, most modders will cut a window into their case so that you can see inside to all the cool components and the lighting and the wiring and the cooling system and all that sort of thing. And that's great. But the thing is, when you put that window in, look what you did. You chopped a big hole in your Faraday cage. I mean, what? I don't even... Honestly, I know there's going to be a lot of people that write in and say, well, I've used my computer without a window for years and I haven't had a problem. Sure you haven't. I can just see you at your little LAN party, having fun, got a great kill-death ratio, you got a great kill streak going on, big high score, and then your computer locks up. And you're sitting there going, why can't Microsoft make a halfway decent operating system? My God, it locked up again. Now I'm going to have to reinstall all the drivers and everything. I swear, the next time I see Bill Gates, I'm going to punch him right in the face. Well, before you go inflicting harm upon Bill Gates, you better make sure your own house is in order, so to speak. Now, I know that the window size is still small enough that it's going to filter out most electrical noise, even the 60 cycle hum. I mean, that wavelength is huge. But the thing about it is, that's, that's a bit like me saying, well, my favorite hobby is parachute jumping. And I love to parachute jump with a parachute that's too small. You go down really fast. It's super fun. It sounds unsafe, but you know what? I don't have a problem because I have really good boots. And the thing is, I may be able to parachute jump like that for years and not have a problem. But is it wise? Is it the smart thing to do? Well, of course not. Now, if you're going to put a window in your PC, you should use what's called Modder's Mesh. You can also get it in hardware stores as hardware cloth. It's metal mesh, but you can still see through it. And when you put that mesh in there, don't just glue it in place. Make sure you've got a good electrical connection between the mesh and the panel, good connection between each panel and the power supply, and thence to ground. And then your system's really going to be safe. Now this is my PC. Check it out. Do you see a window in the side of this thing? Hell no you don't. And there's a good reason for that. I want to make sure that I have a good solid Faraday cage. Now this Faraday cage has some small holes in it, just like any PC. But like with a microwave oven, it keeps out most of your heavy duty electrical waves. And not only that, I've made sure that each case panel has good connectivity to the power supply and that the power supply has a good ground path from its cord. So this whole Faraday cage is solid and it's clean, sanitary, full metal jacket. What just happened? Now years ago the only case you could get was beige with no window in it. 
the fact that I could find a black one was pretty radical. But now they sell cases that are pre-modified, which means they have a window built in. Now, they always used to sell these things, but they always had a grill or piece of mesh behind them. Now, the reason for that was not to keep out the mice and the cockroaches. That was to keep out electrical interference. But heck, nowadays, they sell cases with a great big window with no mesh in it. Now, I know that's what people want to buy. That's what they want to see. But is that wise? Is that the smart thing to do? And don't even get me started about these guys. In case you don't want to click through to the links, they have built their computers with cases made out of acrylic. Which means there's no metal in the damn things at all. Are you kidding? Ow. I, I just don't even know where to, go, where to start with these guys. I know you've probably seen some things on Reddit or something that show a, people running a computer with a case like this or made out of a beer box or something like that. And yeah, it's going to work. But for how long and how reliably? In order to have a reliable system, you're going to have to have good grounding and a Faraday cage. And none of these systems have that. So, now you'd have a better understanding of what grounding is and what it isn't. Now you should understand why our plugs are asymmetrical and preferably have three connectors. And now you should also understand why shielding in a Faraday cage is important and how to make sure it works properly. Thanks for watching.